beautiful set of uh, participants and I, I just browsed through them. Uh, I know many of them, so that's great. Um, I'm responsible for, for Comulis as a chair and um, I'm, I'm specifically happy about this uh, collaboration we set up with Eurobio Imaging, this joint correlated imaging series to really um, promote and, 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 and push actually the benefits of uh, correlated and multimodality approaches. It's an educational lecture, but it should also highlight uh, a lot of exciting biomedical research and also present the limitations and benefits and principles of, of such correlated approaches. It's not only on, on biological microscopy, but we will also have other subjects on preclinical imaging, for example. But I'm very happy now to have um, cryoclem, uh, cryoclem talk. Um, uh, yeah, very interesting topic. Uh, and I'm also very happy to, to have uh, that Peter agreed on, on giving that talk. Uh, we do not know each other personally yet, but I, I, I heard his name several times already. And um, his, his career has been revolving around cryoEM, I think, about uh, viruses and, uh, and around um, Heidelberg. So he did his PhD at the University of Heidelberg and at EMBL, then had a, a quick tenure or even an extended tenure with John Briggs before he went for his postdoc to NIH and is now a group leader at the University of Heidelberg again and focusing on membrane biology uh, using cryo-electron microscopy or, cry or advanced electron microscopy, including correlated approaches. So the, the stage is yours, Peter. Thanks for accepting and really looking forward to, to your talk and um, to enjoy you. Yes, hello everybody. And thank you so much, Andreas and uh, all the organizers for this great opportunity that we can share a little bit of our work with you and also try to explain the concepts of cryoplan for adherent cells. So yes, I will talk today about uh, strategies for milling, basically clamp strategies for milled cells, because that's this more challenging than um, correlate, correlating uh, 2D in 2D, because this involves also 3D correlations. And I will focus mainly on virus infected cells, because that's what we are mainly interested. And uh, we will cover several topics, and we will basically talk about uh, cryo clamp challenges, which are inherent to cryofit milling but we will also look into consideration for sample preparation. So if you like to prepare your cells to optimize that they grow on the grids, how to do it. And we will also cover something which is very important and that's the cryo light microscopy and its limitation and challenges. And then towards uh, the second part of the talk, we will uh, go over some study cases. So that's actually projects we are doing in the lab currently. And we will focus on trying to clam uh, influenza A virus fusing inside the cells, which is quite challenging. And uh, there are different approaches to do that. So I will, we will cover three different approaches. One is called post-TEM clam, one is targeting clam, and the other one is on lamella clam, which I will talk only briefly about. So uh, as you know, it is really useful to use clam for, for, to study virus-host interactions. And uh, I don't have to here stress that cryo-electron tomography is very beneficial, especially for studying viruses which are pleomorphic, and we can directly zoom into these viruses and see how proteins uh, interact with membranes and how these uh, proteins are organized into complexes and encapsulate genome. And we can, of course, also increase the resolution by use subtomogram averaging. Now, when we would like to uh, look at how these viruses are interacting with cells, then it gets much more complex because the cell is much larger and has many more uh, molecules and many more proteins. And so we need light microscopy to zoom out into these infected cells. And uh, that, uh, of course, then also requires that we have fluorescently labeled viruses. And that is not so simple to force and label viruses that they are still vital and also infectious. But once we have them, we can then follow the viruses inside the cells and see how they interact by light microscopy or by cryolite microscopy. And if we then want to again zoom back what is actually happening in these areas where we have the interaction, we need to bridge the resolution gap by using in cellular cryocorrelative light and electron microscopy. 
And uh, this is not new, this has been done before and there are some very nice studies. And this is one of them where, which is done actually from by Briggs Group, by Martin Sharp, where we have a cell which is transfected with uh, fluorescent GAC protein. So HIV GAC protein is a protein which uh, uh, is very important for budding of the virus of HIV and the budding occurs on the cell plasma membrane. And uh, because it occurs on cell plasma membrane, what we can do, we can directly correlate the cell fluorescence to the EM because EM can penetrate or transmission electron microscopy can visualize the periphery of the cell because it is relatively thin. And then we can see this budding virions here or VLPs, which are nicely, you can see the gut layer as well and study it at high resolution. Now, in virology, what is uh, also very important is what is happening inside the cell. So, and that is much more challenging to study by CLAM and also to deliver high resolution and to do it at, in cryo conditions. And as you may know, viruses, they completely remodel the cell in order to replicate inside the cells. And some of them, like for instance, positive single-stranded RNA viruses, they use uh, intracellular membranes to replicate and they completely change these membranes into small vesicles where they uh, basically concentrate the replication machinery and also this protects the replication machinery from immune system of the cell. Other viruses, they use principles of liquid-liquid separation to do the same. And uh, DNA viruses, for instance, like box viruses, they make their own nuclei, which they basically surround with the ER. And so the viruses, they really change the cell a lot. And in order to reach this area, we need to kind of uh, thin the cell because as I told you, we can only observe, without any thinning, we can only observe the periphery of the cell such as, and then we can study events like entry or budding. But to study the, what is happening inside, we need to thin the cell. And there are several ways how to do it. And previously, um, this was a technique developed uh, by Jacques Dubochet's lab, uh, mainly by Ashraf Al-Modi, uh, and that was uh, relying on microtomy. So here, the cell would be, cells would be high pressure frozen, which is also a very good freezing method and allows to freeze even very large samples or pieces of tissue. And that would be then sliced by a diamond knife. And this diamond knife has a this slicing or ultra microtomy has an advantage that we can produce ribbons of sections of a very, very thin sections, 50 to 100 nanometers. And uh, we can follow the whole volume of the cells. And then we can also use cryolite microscopy to basically see, see these uh, fluorescence and also quite precisely correlate it because it is, uh, doesn't have any 3D uh, so basically dimension. And then we can, of course, see also the structures. The problem of this method is that due to the uh, compression of the cutting, there are many uh, surface artifacts and also we can actually see the compression in the, in the cell structure. And what is next problem is that these sections are often not well attached to the, to the grid and they are very baby. And so this is problematic for cryo-electron tomography. So the uh, currently mainly used method to thin cells is uh, cryofocus and be milling. And I do not have to go here to details. There's a lot going on about this topic. It was originally established uh, in uh, New York State by Mike Marco and then re uh, really developed much farther in Martin Sweet uh, uh, by Baumeister's group. And uh, this microscope has a two, two columns. One is a scanning electron, one is a focus ion beam and can be used to micro machine the cells to remove the material which we don't want because we want to penetrate only a very thin lamella at the end. And this lamella is actually then hanging in the body or is uh, hanging in the body of the cell still. And so this is very powerful, but it has also some disadvantages, this method. And uh, disadvantage of, of it is that we are just really looking at a very small fraction of the cell. And if you think about it, a cell, depending on a cell line, can have a height of six to eight microns and a diameter 40 to 60 micrometers. And uh, the lamella is really, really tiny. It's uh, 20 by 10 by, by 200 nanometers. 
And uh, this, if you then calculate the volumes of the cell, this is the volume of the cell is around 1700 cubic uh, microns for this kind of a cell. This is for A549 cells. And uh, uh, the, the volume of the lamella is uh, 40 cubic microns. So it is only two to three pros per percent of the total volume. And, and that is, uh, of course, very challenging. We lose all the information which is above and below. And uh, then also this is very challenging for correlation itself because we don't have a serial section where we can follow up the, the, the cell itself, the cell volume. So how do we actually correlate these, uh, these uh, lamella? And that's what we will spend some time on. And there are these three approaches and one of them was already developed in 2016 in Baumeister's group and this, by Baumeister's group. And this is site-specific cryofib targeting which uh, basically uses an, uh, uses an advantage of uh, having beads as fiducial markers, which we can see in both light and SEM microscopy, and that will help us to target exactly where the fluorescent uh, area is. Second approach, which we will also cover, is an uh, approach which we use to correlate uh, the fluorescence after uh, we have already acquired the DEM, so it's called post-DEM. And then the third one is uh, using assisted cryo-LM, which is integrated into the, into the microscope, into the cryofib. And uh, so before we go to these methods, we have to a little bit talk about cryolite microscopy because that is inherent to all of these methods. And cryolite microscopy has been also developed actually partly in, in, uh, in Martin Sweet, but also, also in EMBL by, by Briggs Group, also by Martin Short. And this is a Leica microscope, which we also have here. So I will mainly talk about Leica microscope. Uh, it's a microscope which uses a 50X uh, lens with a 0 0.9 uh, NA. And the reason for this lens is that uh, because we need to keep the samples cool at very low temperatures at minus 190 degrees Celsius, we don't, and the objective itself, it's not actively cooled. We don't want that the objective would warm up the, and vivitrify the sample. And so these are long distance lenses. And because they are long distance lenses that they don't use any immersion oil, we compromise on the resolution we can achieve. And the XY resolution is not so bad, but what is a problem is usually the uh, axial resolution, which we really need in order to do targeted milling or any kind of correlation on lamella. And so if we look at what is the resolution we can achieve, it is axial resolution is somewhere between 800 to 1000 nanometers in, in, in Z. And uh, if we of course use confocal, there are also now cryoconfocal microscopes available, then we are much better doing around 400, 500, but still it is not really enough uh, to meet the requirements for thickness of the lamella, which ideally would be around 150 to 200 nanometers, because that, that allows to have a very good signal to noise ratio in cryo-electron tomography. And so if we look at a cell, the scheme of the cell and a lamella going somehow through here, which is 200 nanometers, we have to always consider also the sampling method in C, and that's very important. So with the wide field, of course, it is really low resolution. So we have around 900 nanometer resolution here. And obviously we cannot precisely uh, uh, know based on this resolution, we cannot then later precisely allocate where the fluorescence of the lamella will be. So confocal microscopy will improve that, but still it's not really perfect. And so ideal resolution also based on the Nyquist sampling would be then to have a, at least 100 nanometer resolution in C to be really able to localize in the cell and to have a pre very precise, very precise targeting of the, of the material. Now, of course, what is very helpful, and especially if, uh, for us, since we have only wide field microscope, we use the convolution to remove out of focus information. And this really helps to also increase the resolution in Z and to be more precise in targeting or in correlating the lamella. And uh, here is uh, an example of what can be achieved with a cryo wide field like, like a microscope. This is a cell, which uh, A549 cell, which is overexpressing a neon green tech protein. And uh, you can see this is the wide field 
image and after the convolution in any in autoquant, uh, which we use, you can then, of course, reach much better resolution. And this is really important to do for, for cryoclam, uh, for milling, and it really helps since the data then is kind of almost comparable to what is possible to obtain with a confocal microscope. Uh, at least uh, it improves a lot. So now when we covered uh, the cryolite microscopy, I would like to spend a little bit more time about grid supports and for uh, and some comments on growing the cells on the grids because the sample is actually is extremely important and flatness of the sample is very important for success of uh, correlation. And so what uh, is really advisable is to be very careful when handling these EM grids and during seeding of the cells, what we like to use is either, either PDMS coated grids, uh, coated dishes, which uh, then are very soft and one can nicely and easily pick up the grid. PDMS also can be patterned, so you could also have some kind of pattern here to hold the grids, that they are not floating around. Or what is also really an excellent way to, to grow your cells is to use uh, the grid holders, which were developed by Florian Schur's club. And uh, there is also an advantage in virology that when we actually infect cells in these kind of holders, we do not need much virus, so we can also save an, on a lot of virus. So that's also really uh, highly recommended. If, uh, uh, it's, if you have the option to use micro patterning, it is also really advisable to use it because the cells, they tend to grow sort of randomly on the, on the grids and uh, because they do not like this perforated carbon foil, they then prefer also to grow on the grid bars. And this is of course what we don't want. So uh, patterning, which has been lately established uh, by in three independent uh, groups here, uh, is very, very powerful and can help you and facilitate the whole cryo plan. If you don't have an option for patterning, then still one can kind of tweak it that, and convince the cell to grow in the, in the, uh, in the center of these uh, grid squares by using a different uh, uh, patterns. And, what is uh, advisable to use here is to use uh, patterns which have much more carbon and much less holes because then the cells will also be growing preferentially inside. In, inside, it's not preferentially, but they'll also grow in the, inside the squares. So uh, there are different supports which one can choose. Carbon is standard, but perhaps not the best uh, support which one can use for growing cells. Silicon dioxide is uh, much more robust and also it's a little bit more flat. And of course, one could also use uh, gold uh, foils, which are very flat and also a little more stable. Uh, for, for grid selection as a mesh, one has to use, of course, some biocompatible com material like gold or titanium. Titanium has the advantage that it's very sturdy but it has a low thermal conductivity, which might impact uh, the plunge freezing, also the vitrification during plunge freezing. And so uh, it's not uh, actually a famous phenomenon, which was already described in 1993 by Frank Bui. And uh, this is that the carbon film is uh, not staying flat when the grid is cooled down, and this is called cryocrinkling. And it's also can cause some problems during uh, milling or imaging. So this uh, is also nice to, if it's possible to avoid. And this is caused because you, especially for copper or for gold, uh, these metals, they have a very high linear thermal expansion coefficient and they will shrink more than the carbon itself. And so to avoid, avoid this, one can actually choose the right, uh, right, car, right metal and right film. And uh, the most advisable, what is probably or the best match is to go for titanium grids because they have much lower, much lower uh, linear thermal expansion coefficient and cover them with uh, either carbon or sili silicon dioxide or use uh, gold grids with gold film. And uh, this has been very nicely described in a recent paper also by from Yuria Mahamid's lab uh, where they, especially in the supplementary data, there's a lot of information which I recommend to look at. Now, what is also very interesting, especially with gold foils is that that has a 
very interesting uh, impact on cryolite, consequences for cryolite microscopy, is that uh, gold foil is increasing the fluorescent signal, which you can get, and that might be very useful if your fluorophore is very weak. And this is a carbon foil here grid with uh, cells which are kind of randomly growing, and as you see some of them, they like to grow on the, on the bars. And that those which grow at close to the bars, they have a really extremely strong signal. Whereas those which are growing on the, on the carbon, they do not have such a strong signal. If you look at a grid, which is uh, actually with a gold foil, so not only gold grid, but uh, this is not a carbon foil, but gold foil, you will not see this problem because the, grid, the cells, they are also growing on gold. And so the material, which is the reflection from the, of the fluorescent signal is uh, similar on, on both of the bars and also on the perforated uh, 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 gold foil. And this has been actually reported before in 2007 by a group which uh, described this phenomenon, but it's not really much used, this phenomenon, and it's ideal for upright microscopy with uh, where we are limited on to low numerical aperture objectives. And what we see here, we have a silver coated uh, 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 support, glass light, where we have cells. And this is actually a line which is not, not coated. And you can see the difference is really remarkable. And this is nicely actually plotted here on this, on this uh, chart, on this plot, where you can see that even for, for a numerical aperture objective 0 0.9, which we are using in our cryolite, we have a 2, .2 to 3 fold enhancement of resolution, and this might have a very important consequences for cryo super resolution microscopy when we don't want to use such high power lasers. So I believe that cryo uh, that uh, gold foil supports uh, are important for future of cryolite imaging. However, uh, they are also issues with these foils is because they uh, because of this uh, very strong difference in the reflection between the holes and the foil they cause uh, imaging artifacts. So this needs to be optimized by using different patterns. What is also very important is to keep in mind that uh, uh, humidity is uh, usually a problem and uh, it can cause uh, during this sample transfer in the workflows, which are often very complicated, it can cause a lot of ice content on the grid which is then troublesome for targeting the targeted milling or for milling itself. And so what we really recommend, if you do not have a room where you have a controlled humidity to at least 30%, to, to really build a chamber around, around your microscope and also for the transfer and uh, uh, use uh, some gas or compressed air to reduce, to reduce humidity. And in Heidelberg, we have a very high humidity and this is really helping us a lot to be able to work also over the summertime. So yeah, I will now, when we went, go through these technicalities, I will now uh, show you an example and we will go to a real biology sample where we use uh, cryoplan uh, to localize infected cells or viruses in infected cells. And we will now talk about this post-EEM uh, cryoplan approach, which we have uh, established in our lab. So, uh, of course, we always want to have some biological question. We are not just developing the methods for, for or, or establishing the methods for fun. And we are very much interested in influenza A virus, which is a very important human pathogen. And uh, this virus is also quite fascinating, as you can see here. It is a pleomorphic virus with a membrane envelope. And inside the virus, as we look at a bit closer to the virion, we can see there are uh, these uh, complexes, and these complexes are called RNPs or ribonuclear protein complexes. And each of them, they carry a segment of the genome of the virus. On the surface of the virus, we see uh, different spikes, and uh, there are two different spikes. One is called neuraminidase, that's this one, this very short one. And then we have this longer ones, and this is a hemagglutinin. And hemagglutinin is uh, very important for fusion of this virus because it's an envelope virus. In order to infect a cell, it has to fuse with a membrane of the cell. And uh, this uh, happens uh, actually uh, very fast. And it is uh, governed by this protein, which is hemagglutinin, which is uh, 
synthesized in metastable form or metastable conformation. And upon a trigger, which for HA is a low pH, it will rearrange its uh, structure dramatically to drive membrane fusion and to bring the endosomal membrane and viral membrane close together to form a fusion pore. And uh, this is an energetically very expensive process. It has been studied uh, extensively in vitro and with liposomes, but it, there is a very little known about how this happens inside the cells and how this is controlled inside the cells. And so if we look at the replication cycle of the virus, uh, virus enters, influenza virus enters by clathrin mediated endocytosis, and at low pH, late, uh, at late, in late endosomes where there is low pH, the fusion is triggered and this allows to release the genome and start a replication of the virus. And so inside the cells, this process is actually controlled and there is a very interesting protein called interferon inducible transmembrane protein 3, which has been discovered as a very potent inhibitor of the fusion. And so we wanted to know, or we want to know how this protein actually functions. And for that, we have uh, obtained a stable cell line, these are A549 cell lines, so type two pulmonary cells, which overexpress this protein. And this protein is tagged with a neon green, which is a very bright uh, green fluorophore. And as you can see, we can then see these organelles, and there are many of these organelles, which uh, are late endosomes and lysosomes, basically, in these, in these, in these images. And so because we have many of these organelles here, and also because ifitin 3 is able to block membrane fusion, which is otherwise very transient, we uh, do not really need to target, in this case, a single virions, but we expect to have accumulated, arrested many virions in these, in these organelles. So we will focus basically on correlating these organelles rather than the virus, because the, to correlate the virus is much more challenging. So how do we do that? So we will use this kind of the scheme, the workflow, uh, which we have established. So the cells are seeded on the grids as we discussed, and then we infect them with uh, many viruses because we also have quite, we want to have quite good chances finding these viruses. So we use 200 viruses, approximately 200 viruses per cell. And then after infection, we plunge freeze immediately without the need of a fixation because this is all done in biosafety level two labs, and then we image the cells, the infected cells with a cryolite microscope, as I mentioned, like a cryolite microscope, which we have. And these cells are also stained with uh, lipid blue, which is a stain for lipid droplet, and which you will see it later is very important. After we acquire these stacks and we find suitable cells for milling, we then produce lamellas in a standard way, as it is uh, re reported in many publications. And then we uh, map these lamellas with a higher or intermediate resolution to have a very good uh, maps, that TM maps or no tomograms. But we also take tomograms in the areas which are interesting, which may uh, basically represent late endosomes. But at this point, we don't know actually where, where the signal is. So to find where the signal is, we do last step, and that is the cryolite microscopy again. And we image only these uh, lamellas, which were already milled, and image also by, by transmission electron microscopy. And this allows us then to use this information and this information and combine this information to extract the fluorescent, which really is only inside the lamella. And then that extracted slice can be correlated with the DEM map, which I will show you later. So this is how it uh, works. So this is sort of step by step going through this workflow. So here we have a cell which is, um, uh, which you can see in blue, there are some lipid droplets and the green signal, which are these uh, ifitin 3 neon green uh, compartments, positive compartments. Then we roughly target this area where we see uh, many of them, but we don't use any precise targeting at this point, And we produce lamella. This lamella is then mapped in the cryos microscope. And then we also take tomograms of interesting organelles, which could be the, the ifitin 3 positive organelles. So this is also quite nice because we don't have to be biased at this point. And we can take tomograms of whatever we find also interesting. 
And uh, then we take again this lamella out and we take them to the cryolite microscope again. And you can then see the lamella. They might be even a little bit ice contaminated, but that really doesn't matter so much. And uh, uh, then we, what is important is that we have still this fluorescent signal around. And that fluorescent signal will help us then to correlate the map, 3D map before and after. So these are both Z stacks. Uh, which we have to then deconvolve because uh, otherwise we would not obtain uh, enough resolution. So after deconvolution, the data of course looks much, be looks much better. And then we can really perform some uh, alignment and registration, which is uh, done based on the intensity of these of this map. But it's a 3D, 3D rigid transformation. And so this is then the registered stack, again, reassembled stack. And also because you know, when we do milling, it's not perfectly horizontal, the milling. We have to uh, computationally adjust for the tilt of the lamella. And so that's uh, fairly easy when you look at the X, um, X Z slice of the, of the volume of the, of the cryo light data in bright field, you will see this actually the lamella itself. And you can estimate the angle you can correct the angle, uh, ang angle and uh, re-slice the whole, whole uh, volume. And this re-sliced volume is seen here. So you can see it here, how it's nicely going through and it's tilted and aligned. So after this, we can extract, and this is a bit tricky and I will spend more time on this part, how we can then extract really the, the slice, the cryolite slice from the volume, uh, which really precisely um, corresponds to the lamella itself. And so this is shown here, the one which is extracted, but let's go through it more in detail. And for this, I will use a little bit different data where it's easier to explain because in this data set, we have a lot of lipid droplets and the lipid droplets can be then used to navigate us basically in which Z slice we are uh, on, the, on the lamella and uh, can help us to then extract the correct slides. You can also see the lipid droplets here nicely going through the, through the whole cell. And as you see, the cell in this region is quite, uh, quite flat. So if you go then through the, through the Z slides of the, of the lamella, of the correlated uh, uh, stack, you, will, you can see uh, that some of the lipid droplets are, of course, disappearing. Some of them are appearing. And because we know at our TEM map that we identify that there are uh, two lipid droplets and lipid droplets are really fairly easy to identify on the lamella because of their characteristic density and shape, we can then uh, see a bitch of these slices, this fluorescent slices is best corresponding to this, to this lamella with this two lipid droplets. And in this case, you can see here, these two lipid droplets are very strong at this slide, they have a very strong signal. Whereas here it's very weak and here we lost already one. So this slice is basically the slice which uh, can be extracted and used then for subsequent correlation. And the correlation is done then in ECLEM, which is a software which is very well established and uh, available online also. So we can then use three points to correlate. And in this case, we use two lipid droplets, which are also quite allows us to do it quite precisely because the lipid droplets are again spherical. And if we don't have a, another lipid droplet, we then use one of the corners of the lamella to, to uh, basically align the data. And the product of the alignment you see here. So uh, then uh, this is again the alignment. In this case, we did not really have a lipid droplet here. So we use only the edges, which is less accurate. But then we do rigid transformation and align it again with data. And this is an example of one of these aligned lamella, which even had a crack, but it's a very nice lamella because it had a couple of lipid droplets. So we could quite precisely align the data. And uh, you can see it here, the alignment, uh, it's a lipid droplet stained with the lipid blue. And here it's a, a green signal, which corresponds to this ifitin 3 labeled late endosome. And we uh, have uh, taken actually the data, also a tomogram of this, of this area because uh, we've seen that there is a virus. And so we wanted to confirm that this virus is really present in this labeled ifitin 3 organelle. And you can see this virus here interacting with one of these vesicles. 
so it's uh, not able to to fuse with the vesicle or it doesn't seem to be able at least to fuse. So to conclude about or summarize this, this method, this uh, method relies on two fluorescence or two steps when we use uh, two uh, cryolite imaging steps. And by introducing the second one, then we are really able to align and correlate data on the lamella. And uh, this uh, uh, is, has several advantages, basically, it's, especially when you have lipid droplets present, it can be quite precise. And also when you use the convolution and tilt correction, you can remove uh, around 60 to, 60 to 70% of out of lamina signal, which uh, really improves uh, also the, the correlation. Now, yeah, the advantage is that this is done after the whole work. So you can only do it on lamellas which were successful and not vit perfectly vitrified, which there you see what you want, what is uh, what uh, basically some structures that it's not only nucleus and so on. The uh, disadvantage is, of course, that we don't do cryo-ET on the correlated uh, spot. So that is something which uh, cannot be done in this, in this method. And uh, there is uh, available the code. And also we have a lot of, we have written a chapter, uh, which you are welcome to read and to learn more about uh, this method. So I will now uh, jump into a different approach, which is completely different. And uh, this is basically where we are targeting the fluorescent, fluorescent signal. And uh, this is particularly useful when you are targeting something very rare, like a rare signal or a small, small particle. And this, as I said, this was originally established by Arnold et al. in Baumeister's lab. And also Baumeister's lab had, had used this method uh, and also developed it more later. So why do we use this method now? And in this case, we will now want to catch really a fusing, fusing influenza A virus inside the endosome where we have no inhibition. So there is, this is a ball type cell where there is no ifitin 3 protein which would block the membrane fusion. And so that's of course much more challenging. Viruses are small and influenza is not really an and, and uh, also has a diameter of 100 nanometer. And uh, fusion e events are very fast and rare events. So here, again, targeting is really important and is really highly recommended. Labeling viruses is usually very challenging and introducing any fluorophores into the genome will likely result in attenuation of the virus or that the virus will completely lose the fluorophore. So this is very challenging. So, so far we've been only able to use uh, membrane dyes, which are not 100% corresponding with the virus. Uh, so they also label other membrane stuff, like a, which is co-purified with the viruses and not all the viruses will be 100% labeled, but it's still a good, uh, good way to label viruses. To uh, find uh, that these viruses are actually co-localizing with the endosomes. We use lysotracker, which is labeling all acidified endosomes and lysosomes. And for navigation, we also use HEST, which is very practical, uh, very often to help us. What is very important in this method, because we want to target, we need to somehow before targeting, correlate the images, correlate the cryofit image and cryolite image. And this is done with the help of dynabeads or any kind of polystyrene beads, which are also containing some metallic particles. And uh, this is uh, these dynabeads, they have a core, which is, uh, which is, which can be then, uh, which contains iron and therefore they can be seen easily uh, in the cryo SEM using a backscattered, uh, backscattered electron detector. And also that's important because they can be distinguished from any ice contamination. And they can also be seen in the cryolite microscope because they can be some flor fluorescent. So uh, to do this workflow is slightly different. So we again, although in the beginning it's pretty similar, we again grow the cells, infect them with the virus. Again, we use a lot of virus to increase our chances of catching them. And then we do plant freezing. We again do cryolite microscopy, actually pretty much the same like for the other workflow. And but what is the year? The, uh, the difference is that we have to, before we do the plant freezing, we have to add these fiducial markers, these dynabeads. And uh, then we use a toolbox, which was recently developed uh, 
and also it's a very nice toolbox, 3, 3D CD developed by MPI bio, Biochemistry uh, in Martin Street. And this really helps to and facilitates the correlation, which otherwise it's a bit tricky. So this can be done directly on the cryofipsem, and then the data can be exported into the into the user interface of cryoflip and uh, you can do targeted milling. Afterwards, you have a lamella where you, you have uh, the targeted object and there you can collect cryo-electron tomograms. So this is an, like a beautiful example from Stefan, which he recently got. And this is a cell where we have a, so this cell is actually with all four channels occupied on our cryo, cryo uh, light uh, microscope. So in the green, we have the, we have the viruses, but there are also lipid droplets, but we can distinguish them because the lipid droplets are much, much larger than the viruses, and they do not really co-localize so much with the lysotracker. The, in the red, we have the dynabeads. They often cluster, and it's also very important to optimize the concentration of, of dynabeads. Hex is staining the, the nucleus, and uh, magenta is here, the, the lysodeep red, which is the lysotracker. And if you zoom into the cell after the convolution, you can see quite a lot of beautiful details and including the viruses, which are kind of co correlating with the, well, co-localizing with the endosomes. There is some error because of the mismatch of the channels, which would have to be cor corrected to see that very precisely. So how does it work? It's uh, well described in this uh, 3D CT. So what you do is then you mark uh, these beads in the fluorescent uh, map. So you can choose beads which are ideally separated or which you can, you can choose more than three. I, it's actually recommended to choose more because then of course the alignment will be more precise to for the correlation. And then uh, you mark your target here in the cryolite uh, map. And that is then transferred, and this is where the 3D CT is extremely powerful, will, will allow you to transfer it into the cryofib image, and then you can precisely, precisely uh, target this area. Now, this 3D CT is not doing the uh, targeting, will not import the targeting into the cryofib microscope so that you have to do yourself using either recently uh, published serial FIP a software, or you can also use the implemented image registration in the CryoFib software on the Aculos. At least Thermo Fisher offers that option. And uh, this is a uh, one of the targeted tomograms which we have found and which we have collected. And here you can see the, the vi viruses also inside. So what we want to currently do and what we are currently doing is to actually use our other workflow. So we took this one again and took it again to the cryolite microscope to really verify that this targeting was precise. And uh, this is uh, to combine basically both workflows to, and benefits from them. So again, to summarize this, uh, this cryofit approach, the targeting approach is really powerful when you want to target very rare events. Although in our case, we to be cheated, we had a lot of viruses in our sample. And, uh, but it is very powerful when you have small particles such as viruses, which you want to target. It's really important to, it would definitely benefit from cryoconvocal microscopy because then that will improve the precision of the targeting. And the advantage is of course that you directly then collect the tomogram on the, on the, on the viruses inside the tomogram and inside the endosomes and uh, that you have the 3D data. The disadvantage is that because this correlation is done before milling and before a lot of process, and milling is often sensitive to some movements, uh, it might uh, cause this movement and also curing of the platinum might, might cause some drift and uh, this might uh, change a little bit the position. And so it's important uh, that we would suggest it's important to somehow validate that this, this correlation is actually precise and for that could be used as post -E and CLEM to really validate the precision. And uh, currently there are really nice, nice, really nice software available, which uh, is really making it possible. So the 3D CT and also the serial fit, which uh, is still also, which is now being released also. So this, we went now to this 
three, two different methods and in the remaining few minutes, I just would like to mention an, another approach. We do not have this um, technology here on the campus, so I cannot give you an example on the, the virus infected cells, but would just like to make you aware of this. Uh, and that is the cryo LM assist milling or on Pamela cryoclam where you directly can see the fluorescence on the lamella. And this is a very nice method uh, established by Alex de Marco's lab in, uh, in Australia, where they uh, basically integrated the cryolite microscope into the cryofipsen. And this has several advantages when you don't need to transfer the sample, so you minimize ice contamination. But also the advantage is that then one can monitor the fluorescence during the milling. This will work, of course, only for very bright uh, fluorophores, and that this might be a problem a little bit here. Uh, perhaps can be also combined with deconvolution, and uh, then Z stacks are possible. Uh, but in, certainly, this is a very, a very promising and important approach, and they are now also commercially available systems from Thermo Fisher and from Delmic that you, they can be basically, they can add the cryo-like module into your cryofib microscope. So with this, I come to the end of this uh, presentation and I would just like to summarize and a little bit think about what to do when you have your own project and when you want to do cryo clam on fit cells, which are adherent cells. So uh, of course it depends what kind of a question you have. And sometimes you don't even need to do cor correlative microscopy because it is something very abundant in the cells and, or you want to just verify that you are correlating these, these organelles, uh, which are for instance, some mitochondria or ER, which are uh, modified uh, and there are many of them and they form networks, which are really hard to target actually. So then uh, what might be really sufficient is to do post D and cryoplan. So that uh, might really give you more precise actually correlation of all the structures. If you work with very rare events uh, and uh, very small volumes uh, that, that you want to target, then really targeting is uh, the method of choice, uh, but it really benefits from cryoconfocal microscopy. And as I just mentioned, the confocal microscopy has still limited resolution. So you have to account that there will be some, still some error of the targeted in the Z because the Z resolution of the confocal microscopy is still not as good to, to uh, localize the signal within, within the lamella, which is thinner than the resolution limit. And uh, it requires, of course, the fiducial markers. Uh, I would always recommend combining cryoclam methods also with room temperature clam methods because they are much more precise uh, in terms of correlation. They are much more efficient. You will get many more samples. And it's always a good start to start to, to kind of get to know your sample. And so it's, uh, and they are very well established. So with this, I would like to end and uh, thank very much uh, to my group. And most of the work I have shown today was done by Stefan. And also Benedict, who is now in uh, uh, Medailas lab, he uh, contributed a lot during uh, uh, his master thesis in our lab to the development of, of uh, the cryoclam, postclam approach. And uh, of course, also other members have uh, contributed a lot to the development. Then I would like to also thank to IDIP, which is an infectious disease imaging platform at the university where we have a high-end light microscopes and also the cryolite microscopes and that's headed by Vibor Lakota. And with this, I'm happy to take, thank you also for your attention. I'm happy to take uh, any of your questions. If there are any. Thanks, Peter, for this really nice journey through, uh, through correlative um, electron and light microscopy in, in cryo setups with um, FIPSEM. It was really, really nice. Thank you. And I think you, 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 you perfectly implemented the idea we had with, with an educational talk, presenting the limits, focusing on um, biomedical applications and sample preparation um, challenges. That, that, that was really beautiful. And I also learned a few approaches. So thanks. So are there any questions?
questions. M maybe you can maybe you can just um, speak because I do not see all your hand signs. Uh, so there was a question by Emmanuel, for example. Just speak up. Hi, Peter. Thanks for the talk. Hi, um, Emmanuel. Frank, if you could comment on uh, out of fluorescence, uh, and if you have, I don't know, seen that in your sample, and if you can overcome this uh, out of fluorescence from the cells in some of the channels. Uh, so. We do, do not have that much of an autofluorescence sometimes from the lipid, uh, lipid blue uh, staining. Uh, we have some, uh, but we believe that's mainly the problem of the staining and not the autofluorescence in the channel. But otherwise, we have not really faced so much autofluorescence in the, for instance, in the, in the green channel. Uh, so I cannot really com comment so much, uh, so, so much on that. Uh, sorry. Okay, thank you. Good to know. And then there's a question about the, from Nama about the contamination um, while transferring from one, from one platform to the next. So could you elaborate a little bit more on which, how, how you transfer? Because you, you transfer several times, specifically with a post-TEM approach. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, there, is, there, is, there is an additional transfer. So it's, yeah. uh, it's, but uh, for that last transfer, the contamination is less critical than for the pre previous transfers. So uh, we have uh, our uh, imaging set up basically in different buildings, which makes it even more complicated during the transfers. And especially the plant freezing in cryolite, we have a, in a room where the humidity is not controlled. And that's why, as I mentioned, we use this box uh, where we blow actually compressed air and that we really reduces the humidity and uh, facilitates the transfers. And, uh, maybe one comment why one cannot really do simply uh, cryolite microscopy directly after milling and then go to the cryo TEM is often the, that there is often a lot of contamination on these uh, cryolamina. So uh, we don't really have any special tips. We just, as I said, we use this uh, a box, basically the envir environmental chamber where we keep our samples and we also keep our viewer there at all times to minimize the contamination in the viewer. And then the viewer is transported to our room where we have a cryofipsem, and actually that goes to at least 300 meters walk uh, through the campus. And uh, then uh, luckily enough in our cryofipsem cryos area, we have a 30% humidity. So then the work there is much more comfortable. I would uh, highly recommend having a very good rooms for this uh, cryoplan workflows. So basically the humidity, I think the most controlled humidity is the best way to go around it. And maybe along those lines, could you comment on your success rate, Peter? Um, I imagine because of contamination, because of um, deformations during the milling, that the correlation doesn't work properly, maybe quenching, whatever can occur. Can you maybe give a perspective on uh, yes, so we uh, so the uh, exact success rate we have reported it in the in the, ch in the chapter. I don't remember now exactly by by heart for different samples, but uh, we, we the correlation uh, is when we have a good uh, basically when we have a good uh, lamella, and uh, when we can uh, correlate it, then uh, the mm -hmm. the success rates are uh, around I think if I remember around 60 70 percent so that's what okay. we have if I, if I remember well now and uh, otherwise of course that what is uh, what is usually a problem is that when for instance there is a divitrification and that is uh, I would say a problem in general in in cryofit milling where we uh, have lose a lot of laminas because the cell is simply not vitrified and that's because it's a plunge freezing it's really limiting to always get a good vitrified cells. And so that I would say where we lose often many samples. I have a curiosity. Hi, Peter. Hey. Um, so I was wondering when you do um, light microscopy of the lamella, whether you have ever accessed how, if this is in using uh, devitrification or any problem, um, along that line, and if you notice, I don't know if there's any difference between different wavelengths of the light that you use and so on. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, this is uh, very interesting. So we, yeah, we have not really seen, we also have tried to look at high pressure frozen, frozen uh, uh, grids with, with, uh, and they appear to be very bright somehow. So I believe there is really some problem then, then, uh, then uh, there is devitrification, but we have not really systematically looked, in, looking, looked into that. And of course it would be amazing if we would have a way to say in the cryo-like microscope, oh, this cell is not well vitrified. But I, I, I don't unfortunately know. We, we cannot really directly see that. Um, there's another question on, uh, did you, by Choi, Choi? Uh, did you find EC Clem correlation work reliably correlate? to correlate final SEM lamella image and light microscopy images to determine precisely where to collect tomography on your 3D CT targeted lamella. So um, on the, um, so the 3D, uh, so uh, I mean the, the EC CLEM is, uh, is a software which uh, I mean is quite reliable at least in not the sometimes most user-friendly software I have to say. But it is uh, sometimes a bit too slow, but it uh, seems quite reliable. I don't know if there is some more specific comment to this to this question. Where where is the problem? But I think for us, it uh, also work works quite well. So I feel free to follow up on that question. I, um, if I may ask a question. Sure. Yeah, thanks for the, uh, this uh, nice talk. Just a small technical thing out of curiosity. I think you mentioned that um, when you do fluorescence microscopy on the lamella, you also do deconvolution. Mm -hmm. And it's not clear to me why you need to do that because you have only this thin lamella where uh, mm -hmm. uh, all the fluorescence is, is, um, is located. So mm -hmm. why do you need to remove fluorescence from above and below if there is nothing above and below? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good comment, and I was probably not very clear about about that. So on the lamella, we do not really see any fluorescence anymore, and uh, we have also so there, there are probably two reasons for that. And the first reason is that uh, in our case, we do the EM on this lamella, and that will very likely damage all the fluorophores. So there, that's one reason. But we have also tried looking at lamella uh, in cryolite microscope before the EM. And with our setup, we do not really see any, any much fluorescent inside. And that is uh, very likely because the signal is also quite, quite thin uh, and quite weak as also to collect. So the reason why we do the deconvolution on, on these uh, cryo uh, on these uh, cryo samples is that we want to correlate it with the sample which was uh, collected before milling. And uh, for that, for the registration of these two volumes, it really is beneficial to deconvolve. So we are mainly interested in the signal actually, which is around the cell. Yeah, okay, I understand, thanks. And how do you explain that? Because like, like you said, I mean, the um, electrons are, 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 are going to destroy most of the fluorescence. So how do you explain mm -hmm. um, that you still have fluorescence? So do you, can you have like, a, Yes, uh, I, an evaluation of the proportion that is destroyed or anything like mm -hmm. that. So, in the uh, I mean, only probably in the area of, of the lamella, we do not image the area of the body, and uh, so that one stays intact. That's not being damaged because we, with the beam, we really are only in the area of the of the lamella itself. So the the body of the cell is not damaged. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. But uh, if I may follow up a little bit on that. I, I, th I think I remember that there was also reports that at low temperature, the damage to fluorescence is not as high as, as room temperature. So mm -hmm. perhaps you could still have some signal and that's kind of the uh, sense of my question maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think there are also studies where they see, I don't want to say that it's not possible to see cryo so fluorescent or fluorescent signal on lamella. That is uh, definitely not cor correct, uh, but at least in maybe depends on a fluorophore and how many you know, fluorophores in this area you have. And so in our case, we were not really successful in that. And we have also not tried so much because our laminas were often contaminated when we put them then into the cryo-TEM. So that's why we decided to do this post-TEM correlation. 
but uh, uh, definitely I believe it's possible. I think it might be harder than the approach it's very, very thin, very thin samples, that thin lamella with 100, 250 nanometers to have a very strong signal might be more difficult. Thank you. If, if someone has a more better experience with this, please feel to comment also on that. I would be happy to learn more. I have a, one last question on the on the uh, fluorescent signal. So, with your deconvolution, do you think it would still make sense to 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 try to implement cryo immersed high numerical aperture cryo fluorescence lenses, or because it seems for you it it's it's doing the job, right? Uh, I think that's definitely. I mean, it's really not necessary to for cryo clam of uh, fit mil samples. It's really necessary to improve the resolution of, of cryolite microscopes. So, so we need better cryolite uh, res axial resolution and definitely would be great if, uh, if we could use immersion, uh, immersion lenses, but I still, still think practically it's very difficult to do it and really having uh, be, a be able also to move around uh, large map, map samples with this immersion, mm. which is you know usually some isopropentane or other uh, kind of a uh, yeah, solvent which doesn't freeze at these temperatures. So I think it's quite challenging to go this way and perhaps other super resolution methods might, might actually improve even using this low NA, NA lenses. They are also yeah, quite powerful and you can do a lot of uh, mapping, very quick mapping and so on. And uh, yeah, perhaps then it's better to do to go for integrated approach where you have the cryolite and you re really monitor the SU mill because then you don't actually need a Z resolution because your lamella is getting thinner and you can sort of navigate where you are. So I think this is probably the better way to go. Mm -hmm.